Good afternoon, and welcome to the Walt Disney Company's fourth quarter 2020 earnings call. Our press release was issued about 25 minutes ago and is available on our website at www.disney.com forward slash investors. Today's call is also being webcast, and a transcript of this call will be available on our website. We realize many of you are joining us today from your homes, and we are also hosting today's call remotely. So joining me from their homes are Bob Chapek, Disney's Chief Executive Officer, and Christine McCarthy, Senior Executive Vice President and Chief Financial Officer. Following comments from Bob and Christine, we will of course be happy to take some questions. So with that, let me turn the call over to Bob to get started. Thanks, Lowe, and good afternoon, everyone. As we close out the fourth quarter and reflect back on the year, I think we'd all agree it's been a year unlike any other in our lifetimes, and certainly in the history of the Walt Disney Company. Despite the many challenges and hardships, I'm proud to say we have been steadfast in effectively managing our businesses under enormously difficult circumstances. We haven't just persevered during these tough times, we've also taken a number of deliberate steps and smart risks that have positioned our company for greater long-term growth. And the impressive resilience Disney has demonstrated while looking past today's challenges to set the stage for an even brighter future is direct reflection of our outstanding team. They've done and continue to do an admirable job balancing the needs of our cast, our shareholders, and our guests. Of course, the real bright spot amidst the pandemic has been our direct to consumer business. One year ago today, we launched Disney Plus and it has quickly exceeded our highest expectations. We have since rolled out the service in more than 20 countries worldwide. And on Tuesday, we will launch in Latin America, including Brazil, Mexico, Chile, and Argentina, followed by more overseas markets in the coming year. The response from consumers has been overwhelmingly positive. Everywhere that we've launched Disney Plus, audiences have embraced the wide array of high quality entertainment, both original and library content. And I'm pleased to report that as of the end of the fourth quarter, Disney Plus had more than 73 million paid subscribers, far surpassing our expectations in just its first year. And we're continuing to see positive trends. During our investor day presentation on December 10th, we will provide an update of our global subscriber numbers. The growth of Disney Plus speaks volumes about the strength of our IP, our unparalleled brands and franchises, and our amazing content creators, all part of the Disney difference that sets us apart from everyone else. And when you look across our full suite of streaming service, we have exceeded 120 million paid subscriptions worldwide with impressive subscriber gains for ESPN Plus and Hulu, and Hulu, including the rapidly growing Hulu Plus Live TV. We expect the international launch of our star branded general entertainment offering will enable us to grow our business even further in the years ahead. Given that our DTC business is key to the future growth of our company, we've restructured our media and entertainment businesses. By separating content creation from distribution, we've been able to streamline our processes and better align the organization towards these important strategic objectives as we accelerate our pivot to a DTC first business model. We intend to build upon the success we've achieved thus far and look forward to sharing more of our plans with you at our upcoming investor day. While the pandemic continues to impact our company, resulting in an adjusted loss of 20 cents a share in the fourth quarter, the prolonged situation has prompted us to find new and innovative ways to deal with the difficult and often unpredictable challenges we're facing. We successfully made adjustments and have resumed many of our operations, clearly demonstrating the resiliency the Walt Disney Company is known for. While many of our productions were shut down beginning in March due to COVID, our animation teams were able to work remotely and have continued production uninterrupted during the pandemic. 
We were also fortunate to keep other parts of our creative pipeline active and to continue post-production work for our media networks, studios, and Disney+. Plus. We've been able to develop processes and institute health and safety measures that have made it possible to resume live action production as well. Of course, the unpredictability of COVID may result in unforeseen impacts to current and future productions. On the studio side, we have restarted or completed production on all of the projects previously impacted by COVID, including ones from our Marvel Studios, 20th Century Studios, Searchlight Pictures, Disney Live Action, and Lucasfilm. And we anticipate having eight new projects up and running by January. On the TV side, we now have more than 100 live action, scripted and unscripted projects in active production, with dozens more in various stages of pre or post production. Across all platforms, there's been a great response to our content. A couple of weeks ago, we rolled out the highly anticipated second season of The Mandalorian to rave reviews and incredible social buzz. There's been much excitement surrounding the announcement that Disney Pixar's Soul will be debuting on Disney Plus on Christmas Day. And on the broadcasting side, ABC is now ranked number one, delivering some of the most popular and most watched shows on television, including Dancing with the Stars and The Connors. I want to take this opportunity to acknowledge our incredible local and national ABC news teams for the outstanding work they continue to do under very difficult circumstances. They've been working around the clock, making sure viewers nationwide have access to the most important and accurate information, particularly as it pertains to the COVID pandemic. And they've also done an outstanding job reporting on the election in an informative and balanced way. From Good Morning America holding its spot as the number one morning newscast for the eighth straight year, to World News Tonight with David Muir consistently ranking as the number one evening newscast, as well as the number one program on all broadcast and cable television in the U.S. over the summer. There's no question ABC News is America's number one news source. On the park side, we've proven over many months that we're able to operate our parks responsibly following strictly enforced guidelines provided by healthcare experts, successfully reopening our parks in Orlando, Shanghai, Tokyo, and Hong Kong. We've also reopened Disneyland Paris for several months, although the resort is now temporarily closed due to President Macron's recent lockdown order in response to a resurgence in COVID cases in Europe. People have shown a willingness to visit our parks, which I believe is a testament to the fact that they feel confident in the measures we've taken. And we are very encouraged by the positive news earlier this week on the progress of potential vaccine. Unfortunately, we are extremely disappointed that the state of California continues to keep Disneyland closed, despite our proven track record our health and safety protocols are all science-based and have the support of labor unions representing 99% of our hourly cast members. Frankly, as we and other civic leaders have stated before, we believe the state leadership should look objectively at what we've achieved successfully in our parks around the world, all based on science, as opposed to setting an arbitrary standard that is precluding our cast members from getting back to work while decimating small businesses in the local community. Our ability to operate responsibly in this pandemic environment extends beyond our theme parks. I'm proud to say that we were successfully able to host the NBA and MLS at Walt Disney World in Orlando. It's been a huge undertaking and a great achievement. Just consider the NBA, for example, 94 days, 22 teams, 172 games, players, broadcast partners, referees, media, support staff, and Disney employees, all in the bubble. It was also a big win for ESPN, which broadcast the games, along with a packed schedule of other sports offerings, including the WNBA, college football, Major League Baseball, and the NFL. As you look at the most watched cable shows on TV this year, more than half have been live sports proving that sports are a powerful draw 
despite the disruption of the pandemic. ESPN Digital and ESPN Plus have also performed exceptionally well, with September being the best month ever for ESPN streaming video. ESPN Plus continues its positive subscriber growth, reaching more than 10 million paid subscribers as of the end of the quarter, nearly tripling in size over the past year. As you can see, even during these most uncertain times, here at the Walt Disney Company, we are finding ways to not only operate our businesses effectively, but also take the necessary bold steps for our future growth. And we are more committed than ever to investing in our businesses, in particular, our DTC strategy, which we see as the key driver of significant long-term value for our company. We look forward to sharing details of our plans with you at our investor day next month. We also can't wait for you to see the extraordinary content that's being created for our full portfolio of streaming services, Disney Plus, ESPN Plus, Hulu, and Star. It's just fantastic. And with that, I'll turn it over to Christine. Thanks, Bob, and good afternoon, everyone. Excluding certain items affecting comparability, the fiscal fourth quarter's diluted earnings per share was a loss of 20 cents and our full year fiscal 2020 diluted EPS was $2.02. Our financial results continued to reflect significant impacts from COVID-19, which we estimate adversely impacted segment operating income in Q4 by $3.1 billion. Our parks experiences and product segment was again the most severely affected with an estimated adverse impact of $2.4 billion in the fourth quarter. We estimate that media networks operating income was negatively impacted by approximately $500 million due to COVID, largely due to higher rights costs at ESPN associated with programming in the fourth quarter that was delayed from prior quarters. Another factor that affected our Q4 results was the 53rd week. While last quarter we guided to the 53rd week having a modest adverse impact on operating results, the additional week of operations actually resulted in a benefit. There were a few reasons behind this variance, but the largest driver was related to the timing of sports rights costs. I'll now turn to our results by segment. At Parks Experiences and Products, financial results in the quarter were significantly impacted by restricted capacity and closures. Operating income at Parks Experiences and Products declined significantly versus the prior year to an operating loss of $1.1 billion. This reflects the closures of Disneyland Resort in California and our cruise line business for the entirety of the quarter. Shanghai Disney Resort was open for the full quarter after reopening in May, while Walt Disney World Resort and Disneyland Paris reopened in mid-July. Hong Kong Disneyland Resort was open for a couple of weeks at the beginning and end of the quarter. All of our reopened parks and resorts were operating at significantly reduced capacities during Q4. However, we are pleased to report that Walt Disney World, Shanghai Disney Resort, and Hong Kong Disneyland all achieved a net positive contribution in the quarter, which means we generated revenue that exceeded the variable costs associated with reopening. At Walt Disney World, we are also encouraged by the booking trends we are seeing. Park reservations at our reduced capacity limits are already 77% booked for Q1, with Thanksgiving week booked close to capacity. These trends provide us with further confidence around underlying consumer demand for our parks and experiences. At Studio Entertainment, operating income decreased in the quarter due to lower theatrical distribution and home entertainment results. Worldwide theatrical results continued to be adversely impacted by COVID-19 as theaters were closed in many key markets, both domestically and internationally. With no significant worldwide theatrical releases in the quarter, we faced a difficult comparison against the strong performance of The Lion King and Toy Story 4 in the prior year quarter. The decrease was partially offset by lower marketing expenses. 
Lower home entertainment results were driven by lower unit sales, also partially offset by lower marketing expenses. Unit sales were low.
versus Q3. Disney Plus Hotstar subscriber editions were the largest contributor to this increase, driven by the start of the delayed IPL season. Disney Plus Hotstar subscribers now account for a little over a quarter of our global subscriber base. Disney Plus's overall ARPU this quarter was $4.52. However, excluding Disney Plus Hotstar, it was $5.50. On our last earnings call, we said that we expected the fourth quarter operating results of our DTC businesses to improve by approximately $100 million relative to the prior year quarter. Our results came in better than that guidance, with operating income at our DTC businesses improving by approximately $300 million versus the prior year, due to better than expected performance across all three of our streaming services. I will note that we do not plan to further update any of our subscriber numbers until our investor day on December 10th. At our international channels, lower results were due to lower affiliate and advertising revenues, partially offset by a decrease in costs. Switching gears, I want to take a moment to give you an update on our 21CF acquisition. We've previously stated our expectation that the deal would be accreted to EPS, excluding the impact of purchase accounting for fiscal 2021. While COVID certainly had an impact on these numbers, we estimate the acquisition of 21CF and the impact of taking full operational control of Hulu were accreted in both Q3 and Q4 of fiscal 2020, excluding the impact of purchase accounting. As a practical matter, given our recent reorganization and the successful and complete integration of these assets into the Walt Disney Company, it is no longer practical, nor do we believe it would be insightful into our businesses to break out 21CF performance. Therefore, we do not intend to discuss legacy Fox results or accretion on a go-forward basis. As we've discussed on prior calls, while our liquidity position remains strong, we are continuing to manage our leverage with a long-term commitment to return to levels consistent with a single A credit rating. As part of that commitment, and given limited visibility due to COVID and our decision to prioritize investment in our DTC initiatives, the board has decided to forego payment of a semi-annual dividend in January, 2021. Our capital allocation strategy will continue to prioritize investing in the growth of our businesses, particularly in the direct-to-consumer space. However, we anticipate the payment of the dividend will remain a part of our long-term capital allocation strategy following the return to a normalized operating environment. As we look forward, we expect that our results in fiscal 2021 will continue to be impacted by COVID-19. Our visibility is limited and will be influenced by a number of factors, including but not limited to the recovery of theatrical exhibition, confidence in consumer travel, and the continued resumption of live sports. But as we sit here today, there are a few items we would like to highlight that may help frame expectations for the first quarter. Our parks and experiences business continues to be impacted by COVID-19, and we do not have visibility into how long these impacts will last. While some of our parks are open with limited capacity, we currently anticipate Disneyland Resort will remain closed at least through the end of the fiscal first quarter. Disneyland Paris is also currently closed. Because we have no significant tentpole theatrical releases planned for Q1, we expect that our theatrical results will be meaningfully below the prior year, during which we released Star Wars, Rise of Skywalker, and Frozen 2. We also anticipate that home entertainment, stage play, and studio TV SVOD results will be meaningfully lower year over year. Similarly, 
at consumer products, we expect merchandise licensing results in Q1 to be adversely impacted due to comparisons versus Star Wars and Frozen merchandise in the prior year. At ESPN, first quarter results will be significantly impacted by higher rights and production costs due to the shift of four NBA Finals games and three additional college football playoff games into the quarter, along with incremental regular season college football rights costs shifting into the quarter. This impact is partially offset by an expected delay to start to the 2020-2021 NBA season. We expect the Q1 operating results of our DTC businesses to decline by approximately $100 million relative to the prior year quarter, driven by continued investment in Disney Plus, partially offset by improved results at both ESPN Plus and Hulu. At our international channels business, we expect first quarter operating results to decline by approximately $300 million versus the prior year quarter, driven by a combination of higher sports rights costs due to timing shifts, COVID-related impacts, and channel closures. Our capital expenditures in fiscal 2020 were approximately $4 billion, down about $850 million from the prior year due to decreased spending at our domestic parks and resorts. We expect CapEx in fiscal year 2021 to be $550 million higher versus fiscal year 2020 due to increased investment at our media and entertainment distribution businesses and at corporate, partially offset by reduced spending at parks, experiences, and products. As we've previously noted, we will start reporting under our new organizational structure in the first fiscal quarter of 2021. While our reporting segments will change, we intend to provide key financial and supplemental information, including much of what we report today, particularly as it relates to our direct-to-consumer businesses. As always, our goal is to provide the needed transparency into our businesses. We remain very excited about our future, and we also look forward to sharing more details on our revolving DTC strategy at our December 10th Virtual Investor Day. And with that, I'll turn the call over to Lowell, and we would be happy to take your questions. 